Today we have a lot to cover uh, chronologically, so I want to remind everybody where we are chronologically before we get started. So um, you have the uh, timeline behind you, and again, thanks, thank you to B for working this out. So uh, we have the period of, let's see what it says, right, Judges and United Kingdom, right, is what, where we are. Um, the chronology here is very, very debated and very disputed. Uh, so we may want to go back one step and talk about Joshua's conquest of the land of Canaan. As we spoke about last time, it's not clear that Joshua did conquer the land of Canaan, and therefore the conquest of Canaan was probably not an event, it was probably a process. So it's a process that resists a simple uh, date. So we assume that somewhere in the uh, the famous Merneptah Stele by the end of the 13th century BCE lets us know there was something called Israel in the land of Canaan by the 13th century BCE. Uh, we assume then that's something to do with the period of Joshua and Judges, 13th century, 12th century, somewhere around there. But it's all very, the chronology is all very, very vague. Uh, remember, we have the conquest by Joshua, or the alleged conquest, the ostensible conquest by Joshua followed by the period of Judges in the Book of Judges, uh, which are a series of discrete stories uh, in the Book of Judges. I ask you to look at the story of Deborah, as the most, perhaps the most famous of the judges, certainly the most famous female judge. Uh, that's uh, Deborah. The other famous one is Samson. If you want to look ahead a few chapters, you can have a look at those stories. But these are all discrete stories, right? There's no centralized power. There's no institution of state yet in Judges. When do we see an emergence of an, of an Israelite state with institutions? Well, that's what we call the United Monarchy. That's where we have the emergence of David. We'll talk about him today. Uh, David and his son Solomon, uh, in the storyline, and especially in the book of 2 Samuel, uh, we, get, we see the emergence of a <coughs> monarchy. Saul was a failed monarchy. David is a successful uh, monarchy. And his son Solomon uh, consolidates power and builds up institutions of uh, royal institutions. That's the narrative we get in the Book of Kings. What date do we give for these events? Short answer is we don't know. The longer answer is we assume it's something in the 10th century BCE. So there's much debate among historians whether we can say anything positive historically about these events of the 10th century BCE. And I see that B has this very specific date of 931 BCE, for the end of the United Kingdom. So the United, King, United Monarchy is David and Solomon, Papa David, son Solomon. The death of Solomon, the kingdom splits, and B, from some source or other, came up with the very precise year of 931 BCE. Uh, frankly, I don't know the origins of that date. Uh, B probably has forgotten also where he got it from. But anyway, some book or other said 931 BCE, and I have no objection to that date. I'm simply querying its specificity. Uh, Right, that may give the illusion that we know much more about the chronology than we really do. But we assume it's somewhere in the 10th century, which is where our narrative we're talking about today, focus on, on this period, right, is the, the failed monarchy of Saul, the united monarchy of David and Solomon, the death of Solomon, the northern tribe split off. So that's where we are in the chronology. Okay, uh, thank you again to B for the timeline. So what are we reading again in these books? We're reading a Deuteronomic history, as we call it, written by the Deuteronomist, uh, and this is sometimes called the Deuteronomistic history. So we've covered briefly Joshua and Judges. I can freely concede, not nearly with the attention that they deserve, but time presses. The end of the term is approaching, so we're moving along at a rapid clip. Uh, Joshua and Judges, and today we'll be talking about the story in the book of Samuel. Learn it footnote. There is something called 1 Samuel and something called 2 Samuel. There is something called 1 Kings something called Second Kings, right? Uh, these distinctions are simply a function of the fact that these are very large books, and they were cut into two just to, uh, because the scroll, a, sc a scroll can hold that much. Uh, the scroll gets very, very large and unwieldy. So in the Jewish counting of biblical books, one Samuel and two Samuel count as one book, just divided in, in half, more or less, for convenience. Similarly, one and two king kings are counted as one book, in the Jewish counting, because it's just one book. And indeed, the division into Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings is probably a function of the fact that the story, his book is just very long and needs to be divided up. It is one long story. Okay, uh, 
back to back to where we are, where we were. So we have the Deuteronomic history, and here we're looking primarily today at the books of Samuel, First Samuel and Second Samuel. That's where we have uh, the story of Saul and the rise of David and the story, uh, and then the beginning of Solomon. It spills over into the first chapters of, of First Kings. There are many bumps and inconsistencies in the reading of the story of First Samuel. And it looks like our, our edition of the book of Samuel was not polished sufficiently. And then we had left the editor's desk before it was ready. So there's something wrong with our book of Samuel. So I'll give you two brief, I'll give you two brief examples. There's something wrong both uh, uh, yeah, on the redactional level. So the, the narrator of the book of Samuel has put together bits and pieces of stories that have seemed to have been pre-existing pieces. And he put them together, but did not always succeed in making a unified narrative. Classic example. When and how did David, for the first time, meet King Saul? Was it because Saul is bothered by an evil spirit and his counselors suggest that he get a talented musician who can play before him and thus to relax his troubled mind, and they find this young fellow named David, whom they bring to court, and he plays music, and King Saul is soothed. Or is it that the Philistines were taunting the Israelite troops, and a champion is found to come forward in front of the troops and slay the mighty Philistine warrior, who, after succeeding in uh, beheading said warrior, is brought before the king, and the king Saul says to him, Who are you, young man? Hey, come on, Saul, you're getting Alzheimer's? You just met David. He's been playing the harp for months for you in one chapter earlier. How could you forget by one chapter later who David is? Well, that's an obvious problem. Something is wrong, right? That we seem to have Saul meeting David twice. And the two stories are perfectly fine in and of themselves. You put them together and you read them as a continuous narrative, the intensive reader will notice that something is wrong. Similarly, not only is there a question about redaction, about edit the editorial work of, of the book of Samuel, this seems not to have been polished sufficiently, uh, you can see also on a textual level, the text of the book of Samuel that we have is in very bad shape. This is, uh, I recommend to your attention to those of you who are Hebraists, the classic old book by Samuel Driver called Notes on the Hebrew Text of the Books of Samuel, uh, written over 100 years ago, and Driver already then uh, was you know, trying, to make, trying to get the verses to be proper biblical Hebrew, sometimes with success and sometimes without. In any case, here's a good example of that, where on the editorial level, simply on the textual level, something is wrong. This is the reference in 1 Samuel 11 where we hear about uh, Nachash, king of the Ammonites, is attacking the Israelites, who appeal to Saul for help. After all, he's the king now. That's his job, is to protect them from marauding uh, enemies. Except the, the small problem is that the narrator just starts telling you the story about Nachash, king of the Ammonites. We've never heard of this fellow before, and we have no idea what's going on. We feel like we're in the middle of the story. begins rather abruptly. That is true. It begins very abruptly because our Hebrew text is missing two or three verses, which we now have from the Qumran scrolls. So we now have an introductory paragraph to the story, and now the story gets, takes a proper takeoff, and we get going, and then the story commences. Qumran scrolls are also known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, these are a cache of ancient Hebrew documents that were found near the Dead Sea, not in the Dead Sea. They were found near the Dead Sea in a settlement called Qumran, which is of no consequence to us in this course, except that these are the earliest Bible manuscripts that we have. There are biblical books, non-biblical books in this cache of documents, and the biblical documents, the biblical books that we have here, these are by far the oldest uh, biblical manuscripts that we have. Right? So we have Dead Sea Scroll cop copies from the Dead Sea of fra large fragments of the book of Samuel. So these are by far the oldest biblical documents that we have. So in other words, when these were written in the 2nd or 1st century BCE, okay, Google Qumran scrolls, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, and you'll get plenty of info on the subject. Let's go back to where we are. So this shows that the edition of the text of Samuel that we have 
seems not to have been the best edition out there. There's a long way of saying that scholars read the book of Samuel and try to make sense of what's going on, are confronted by numerous difficulties above and beyond the difficulty I mentioned already last time, which is, is this a historical document at all? Or is this simply a theology looking like masquerading as history? Okay, enough that. You understand the problems and the challenges. Oh, okay. Book of Samuel. Book of Samuel is called that by the name of its major character, who is uh, Samuel who was introduced in a very beautiful story in 1 Samuel chapter 1, another barren matriarch, which motif with which we are familiar. So she prays to the Lord and is blessed with a son, who is Samuel, who is brought up in the uh, tabernacle, or the, the tent, shrine, tent shrine. So this is a pre-literary prophet. He's a prophet. We'll talk about prophets in the next week or two. Uh, again, spelled P-R-O-P-H-E-T. And econ, no doubt, you talk about the other kinds of prophets. Right. So here we're talking about prophets, meaning, uh, well, how would you translate briefly a prophet? Prophet is the divinely intoxicated human. It's a wonderful phrase. I have to think of Abraham Joshua Heschel. Right. So just in, uh, a man who is suffused with divine spirit. It could be a woman, but usually we're talking about men. There are, in fact, seven female prophets in the scripture, according to the Babylonian Talmud. Uh, so, but we're talking about usually about men. So a divinely intoxicated man, a man suffused with divine spirit. Um, the later prophets are lit literary prophets. They write books. Isaiah, book of. Jeremiah, book of. Ezekiel, book of. Then we have a scroll of 12 small books, 12 prophets. But Samuel is a pre-literary prophet. He's a holy man running around doing things, but he's not writing a book or is not remembered for having written a book, or his disciples have nothing to write down after he's gone, as opposed to later prophets. We'll talk about that. So his pre-literary prophet, what does he do? The first one that we see. So it's worth paying attention to see what kind of figure this is. Samuel is a clairvoyant, a holy man. And this is wonderful line in 1 Samuel 99 on your handout. Anyone who went to inquire of God would say, Come, let us go to the seer. For the one who is now called a prophet was formerly called a seer. Who we now call a navi, once upon a time was a chose, uh, a seer. We would say clairvoyant. So what does a clairvoyant mean? Someone who sees things that you and I can't see. Where are my father's lost donkeys? I have no idea. They're lost. But the clairvoyant will know. Don't worry. They're home already. Good that you came. But don't worry. Your donkey has already returned home. How does he know that without a cell phone? Because he's a clairvoyant. <coughs> That's Samuel. So he's a holy man, right? He can do things we can't do. Interestingly enough, he's not a miracle worker. There are two famous pre-literary, non-literary prophets coming up in the book of Kings who are miracle workers first and foremost, Elijah and his disciple Elisha. Right? They are doing miracles right and left. You know, resurrecting dead children, uh, multiplying loaves, uh, uh, you know, that sort of stuff. Right. So that's, that's what they do. They're, mir they're miracle workers. Or they can also zap you if you don't like, they don't like the way you look. Right, those are miracle workers. Samuel is not a miracle worker, but clearly he is a holy man. He has a priestly uh, function. He is raised as a child at the central shrine, here now located in Shiloh in Hebrew. In English you say Shiloh, I think, uh, in, in, the town, in the town of Shiloh. He sacrifices to God at the altar. Everybody has to wait for him to pronounce the blessing before they can start. Um, in fact, that is one of Saul's sins. He doesn't show sufficient respect to Samuel. He doesn't wait for him. And consequently, Samuel blows up at him and says, okay, that's it. You had the monarchy and you lost it. Seems a little short-tempered to me, but okay, that's just my opinion. Uh, so anyway, he has something to do with the sacrifices and the sacrificial religion revolves also around Samuel. He's a prophet, but he acts like a priest. He's a judge. He's a military man, right? Do you remember that dramatic scene uh, where Saul has, has uh, captured, killed the Amalekites? 
but has spared Agag, the last king of the Amalekites, and Samuel blows at him again. I told you to kill them all. Why is he right here? <laughs> Takes out a sword and chops his head off right on the spot. Right on the spot. You don't want to tangle with this guy, Samuel. Uh, but he seems to be a military man also, which is a very unusual. Uh, prophets, as a rule, uh, speak their anger. They don't actually do their anger. But not Samuel. Uh, interesting. Reproves the people. This is what a prophet is supposed to be about. As we'll see uh, when we get to the classic prophets in a couple of weeks. Right? A prophet reproves the people. A prophet's job is to be a social critic. Here, let me tell you all 42 things that you're doing wrong. The kind of guy you don't want to have to listen to, but he talks anyway. That's a prophet. He points out all the social ills. He points out all your religious ills. He points out everything you're doing wrong and why God is going to blow up at you. That's a brief summary of all the classic prophets. So Samuel does that, does that too. Reproves the people. We'll come back to this kingship stuff in just, in just a moment. He speaks truth to power. This is something else that prophets do. Right? They walk up to a king and they say, you will be punished because of your sins. Or famine is coming on the land because of you. Or the enemies will ride roughshod over you because of you and your misdeeds. This is how they talk to a king. And they say, do me something. The king won't dare do anything because he's afraid. Well, he might throw Jeremiah in the pit for a while because he's so annoying, but he doesn't kill him. He won't dare touch his body because he's a holy man. We see that already with Samuel, the very, this very beginning. He is confronting authority in the case of Saul. And he says to Saul, flat out, Saul, you've lost it. You had a king, you had a chance, but you're, it's gone. You're going to lose it. Everybody's favorite scene is, uh, even when Samuel was dead, he yells at Saul. Uh, that's in 1 Samuel chapter 28, uh, the so-called Witch of Endor story, which is a fantastic uh, story. Saul's about to go off to battle against the Philistines, and Saul senses that things are not going well. So he goes to a necromancer to raise the spirit of Samuel to, get the tr- to hear the truth. And Samuel comes up out of the ground and tells Saul, next day, tomorrow, you'll be here with me. <laughs> oh, what a spooky story. It's a terrific story. Anyway, so he, even, even when he's dead, he can't help himself. He's yelling at Saul <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, crit- and, criticize, and criticizing him and warning him and, and so on. This is what the prophet does, uh, speaking truth to power. And Samuel, Samuel certainly does that. We will see as the story develops, Samuel in this sense anticipates later prophets who will are opposition figures. They are critics. They're on the social margins, but they criticize the high priest. They criticize the king. They criticize the institutions of state. They criticize the values of society. Right. We also have in these narratives court prophets. Maybe prophets who are sort of on the payroll, as it were, of the court. Their job is to hang around the court and be the official prophet. You need to hear the word of God? You got your prophet right there. Right? Then he'll provide you uh, an apposite word. One assumes that court prophets, uh, their salary being provided by the monarch, would have a sort of different relationship with the monarchy than these uninstitutional free free radicals uh, who are running around like the proverbial... uh, a cannon on the decks of a ship who just go wherever they want and say what they want uh, without untrammeled by social convention. But even court prophets, as we will see, can criticize the king. So even the ones who are on the payroll of the king, you know, their job, nonetheless, is to say the truth. That's how they are, that's how they are predicted. Uh, that's how they are depicted. Last point, predicts the future. As we'll discuss in another week, I'm going to emphasize this point again, but probably to no avail. Everybody knows the prophets tell the future. Wrong. That's not the function of the prophet. 
right? The prophet is not a weather forecaster who predicts the unavoidable fate. Today it will rain. You're righteous, you're wicked, it doesn't matter. Today it will rain. I'm predicting the future. That's not what prophets are about. Prophets are about something else. Occasionally they do predict the future. That's true. Typically speaking, when they're predicting the future, they're not predicting the future at all. They are giving you a warning. They are giving you a message, and you're supposed to do something about it. I'll come back to this in a couple of weeks. So we see some of that with Samuel. Right? He's predicting the future, sometimes just predicting the future. Usually it's predicting the future because it's part and parcel of his message. This is going to happen implied. If you continue acting this way, or because of the sins that you've done, that's why this is going to happen. That's typical prophetic discourse, as opposed to, let me tell you who's going to win the horse race tomorrow. That kind of prediction in the future, prophets don't do. But we do have these predictions here. Um, destruction of the house of Eli, we say in English, or Eli in Hebrew. Saul will not have a dynasty, Saul's death. Right? That's, these are depictions of the future, but they're not really future predictions by themselves. They are predictions of the future, part and parcel of um, his conception of divine providence, how God runs history, supervises human events. So Deuteronomy 18 makes it clear that certain kinds of mantic acts are prohibited to Israelites. And instead of those prohibited mantic acts, such as necromancy, right? instead, God will appoint for you a prophet. And the word there is navi, the word. Uh, so you have a prophet. You, don't, you can't go to a soothsayer. You can't go to a necromancer. You can't do various other... The whole list of technical terms are given there. I'm not sure how to translate them into English. It's for prohibited arts of magic, we would call them. And instead, you have a navi. So it's understood that the, there's a competition between that which is licit and that which is illicit. Uh, so there are certain ways of predicting the future that are perfectly acceptable and other ways that are prohibited. Right? The, this comes to a fore in, first, in the story of, of the Witch of Endor. Uh, that, I said that terrific story, which I already alluded to earlier, where the story begins that Saul had enforced this uh, prohibition by removing all the necromancers from the land. So if you want to raise the sooth to, get, uh, the, the, to hear this, the ghost predicting, talking to you, there's no one around who has to take the technology for it anymore because Saul has killed them off or chased them away. Except there's one old lady that ain't door. That's the one, of course, Saul goes to. Uh, and she raises Samuel. Now the interesting point here is that it works. Necromancy is, is not prohibited because it's fake. It's prohibited because it's true. It actually works, but it's prohibited. Why is it prohibited? Well, apparently it's something to do about disloyalty to God. But that's not explained. You go to a prophet. You Israelites, you go to a prophet. You don't go to a necromancer. It's absolutely, as I said, read Samuel 28. It's a wonderful chapter. Absolutely wonderful. Those of you who are classic music buffs, you can listen to Handel's Oratorio, Saul. Okay. Kingship. Uh, a major motif of Samuel. He's now the, the uh, circuit prophet who runs around uh, you know, in charge of society, the holy man, uh, the judge, the, uh, all those other functions. But the Israelites turn to him and say, Samuel, it's all very nice, but we need a king. We need a king just like all the other nations. We need a king. What does Samuel say? Samuel, who seems to be a man with a short fuse, a short temper, right? Samuel blows up and says, your request for a king shows disloyalty to God. Because if you truly trusted in God, you wouldn't need a king. You wouldn't want a king. But all right, you want a king? I'll get you a king. So when Saul goes out and sets out to find a king, he has a long speech. First of all, he says, you want a king because you're disappointed in me? 
He, he asked plaintively, have I stolen any, any of your food, any money, any of your crops, any animals? Have I taken bribes? Have I done anything wrong? No, Saul, we love you, we love you, we love you, but we want a king. Then Saul goes on, cont- continues, and says, a Samuel continues, I'll tell you all the terrible things the king's going to do. The king's going to build a palace. He's going to collect taxes. He's going to take your daughters. He's going to take your sons. He's going to take your crops. He's going to do all these things. That's the king that you want, all right? I'll get you a king. That's a s- s- summary of uh, the speech of Samuel. In other words, the message that we're getting very clearly is an anti-monarchic strand in this narrative, right? in which the monarchy is seen both as princi- in principle as somehow lack of trust in God, that you're putting your trust instead on human authority and human institutions, that there, that act itself is seen as a ipso facto, uh, a rebellion against God. And then on the technical level, what would the king actually do well, he's going to do good things, like you know, take out the army and protect you from your enemies. But on the other hand, it comes at a great cost. <coughs> so this narrative, I would say, there's a strong anti-monarchic streak in this narrative. So now that the prophet is being pushed aside in favor of the king, and the narrator does not like that, and puts that, those sentiments in the mouth of Samuel. Now, okay, that's interesting in itself, but what makes it very complicated is the parallel passage in Deuteronomy 17. What does Deuteronomy 17 have? Deuteronomy 17 says, as part of Moses' farewell discourse, if when you come to the land that God has promised to give you, blah, 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 and you say, I want to appoint over myself a king, just like all the nations around me, there's actually the same phrase as in Samuel, then, Moses continues, appoint for yourself a king. Go ahead, have a king. And here are some rules the king should know. He should not do this, he should not do that, he should write a copy of the law, keep it in his bosom all his days, and that's, there, and there you go. You've got a king. So, what's the problem, class? So Deuteronomy says, have a king. Samuel says, Asking for a king is sin, is rebellion, is error. So, two of the biblical texts are, have different motifs. In and of itself, is that a problem? No. What makes this such a problem? Somebody tell me. What makes this contradiction, or this tension, I should say, very problematic? Yes? It's the same writer. It's the same writer. Uh, or it's the same school. The Deuteronomist, the narrator of Samuel, belongs to the Deuteronomic school. So how come Deuteronomy, the mothership, says, want a king? Have a king. And when Samuel confronts that exact situation, he says, you've made a terrible mistake. How do we explain that? Answer, I don't know nor have I seen anybody who has properly explained this. So there seems to have been different voices within the Deuteronomic school, and maybe earlier the Deuteronomists were okay with kingship, and then something happened, and there I got opposed. I, I don't know how to explain this. I, I just don't know what to do. There's something wrong here. Okay, so the book of Deuteronomy is okay. It's not enthusiastic, but it's perfectly accepting of kingship, and Samuel clearly um, regards kingship as evil or at the very least, mistaken. There are contradictions between the narratives and the laws. We've already seen some of that. Just remind you now, reminder, right? You remember the book of Genesis, where the patriarchs don't always comply with the law that will later on be canonized in the, in the Torah. Building altars, marrying two sisters, right? Things that are just sinful, but they do it anyway. David founds a dynasty, Saul does not. Saul's a big, strapping, tall guy, um, very strong, brave, you know, good, hearty, country, peasant stock, just what you, just what you want to help lead the army. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, Saul, after all, commits sins, from the short-tempered Samuel's point of view, right? And Saul loses the monarchy. And then Samuel sets out on the journey to find a replacement and lights upon David. David. So David does found a dynasty. And we have this chapter of 2 Samuel 7, 
which is a, uh, a remarkable chapter, which spells out the, uh, the charter of the Davidic dynasty. Is that right? Is that 2 Samuel 11? Seven. There's seven. Okay, let's confuse myself for a second. Okay, right. Where it spells out the, the, uh, the dynasty. What happens is David is now king by the second Samuel. David is king. David has built himself a palace. And then David says, you know, God, you're still living here in this tent shrine that we, we got from our ancestors from the desert. Maybe it's time you graduated into a real condo. You know, get a real, you know, a nice place. Nice place. I'll, I'll build you a nice place for you. So God appears again via the court prophet. Uh, the court prophet, uh, Nathan, and God says to David, thank you very much, very sweet of you to think of me, that you want to build a house for me, but I'll tell you what, I'll build a house for you. So we play on house, house, house of course in the sense of dynasty. So David wants to build a divine house, God in return says, I'll build you a house, namely I will make you a dynasty. Now there's an interesting and important uh, point, which is is this an unconditional, timeless covenant? Is it like the priesthood? The gift of the priesthood to the tribe of Levi and the clan of Aaron is eternal. Aaronites have, Cohens have not yet vacated their claims to the priestly authority or priestly rank. Unfortunately, the temple's been destroyed, so we Cohens are out of work, right? But other than that, uh, we Cohens still claim priestly prerogatives and priestly authority. Does the Davidic monarchy similarly a money-back guarantee for an eternal kingship or not? Well, here the texts seem to vary, right? When God gives uh, promises of kingship to David, he seems to say, and if your son steps out of line, I'll give him a few good whacks to uh, bring him back to the proper uh, path, the true and narrow, but don't worry, I won't ever completely get rid of him. Because you're my chosen king henceforth, forever. Of course, that's not how things worked out. The Davidic monarchy does come to an end. After the exile of 587, and a few more paragraphs in the Hebrew Bible, and we never hear about Davidic monarchs again anymore. They disappear. So no doubt the Israel, Israel, ancient Israelite thinkers went back to work and said, well... Gee, I guess it wasn't an unconditional, eternal guarantee, was it? I guess it was conditional after all. It was for a time, as long as you're good. As soon as you get wicked, you can lose it. So our biblical texts sometimes present the covenant as eternal, unconditional, and other biblical texts present the covenant with David as a conditional one. You have the kingship as long as you deserve it. As soon as you step out of line, you'll lose it. Or God will reject you. And presumably, these different uh, conceptions of this uh, covenant have to do with the actual historical facts as they unfolded. But anyway, we have now a king, according to 2 Samuel 7. So God has chosen David to be his king, uh, the official royal line of the house of Israel is the house of David. This brings us to the next point of, is it because David is so righteous? And here it's interesting, the answer is no. David is not depicted as an entirely righteous individual. On the contrary, David seems to have been, in addition to his musical talents, in addition to his bravery, uh, his military prowess, which certainly has, but David also seems to have been something of a, what shall we say, a slime ball, <laughs> right? Uh, a, right, the womanizer, um, right? You know, conspiring to have uh, a soldier killed so he can steal his wife, right? That is not a nice story. It just isn't a nice story, no matter what you do. It's not a good story. So we readers... Uh, are confronted by this, con by this problem where Saul seems to get no slack at all. What, would, what did the terrible deed Saul do? He didn't wait for Samuel at a big party. He started eating first. Saul didn't kill all the Amalekites. He only killed most of the Amalekites. 
That's what Saul does. Whereas David is guilty of murder and womanizing and assorted other crimes and misdeeds and misdemeanors. And Saul, alas, dies in the battlefield and his lion dies with him. And David, of course, becomes the eternal king of the household of Israel. Something of a paradox here. You know, and, the, and the interesting point is that the narrator, Kugel argues the narrator is trying to conceal some of David's misdeeds, but he doesn't conceal them very well, and enough shows through that one can argue there's not much reason to conceal anything anymore. What more do you have to see? But that's David. David is, is uh, the narrator, the narratives about David are, are chock full of folkloristic elements. That's maybe part of it. Namely, as in folklore very often, the hero is not necessarily the most righteous or the nicest fellow. The hero has other qualities. We saw some of that with Jacob in the book of Genesis. He's a trickster hero. Trickster heroes aren't always admirable, but at the end of the day, we have to admire the fact that they, they prosper, they succeed. They endure. And David is like that. So we see folklore here at work. Maybe that's part of the explanation, that the story has a folkloristic tinge to it. Well, it's very clear in his origins. There are seven brothers. He's the youngest. He's a shepherd. This is the David of David versus Goliath. Everybody loves the David versus Goliath story. Who won't like the David versus Goliath story? So uh, these literary qualities push David through, uh, as, as it were. But well, why the narrator doesn't clean up his act more, I frankly don't really know. I guess if you've got a money-back, eternal, unconditional guarantee, it lets you maneuver you know, a little bit, have a little fun, right? But surely that's wrong, what I just said, but uh, I don't know. Let's talk about David and Goliath for one second. Everybody knows the story of David and Goliath, and if you don't, you should do your homework. There's this one wonderful line in 2 Samuel 21, which is listed for you on, on the syllabus. Uh, one of those chapters near the end of 2 Samuel, near the end of the reign of David, and near the, near the end of the, of the book, which we have sort of an appendix, a bunch of chapters which give lists of various things. There's a long poem, a hymn, which is a parallel in the book of Psalms, then we have some lists of various heroes of David, and then it ends with that terrible story about the census at the end. Of two, at the end. Um, in this list of the mighty warriors of King David is, appears the name of one otherwise unknown, Elchanan ben Ya'are or Gim. The Hebrew may be a corrupt, may be the name of a place rather than the name of a person, right? Who, we are told, killed Goliath of Gat in battle. And that's it. He gets one sentence to himself, and that's it. We read that, and we are immediately caught up short, because we thought we knew who killed Goliath of Gath. We thought that was the young David, right, by a, slot, a shot from his slingshot. And it brings down the mighty Goliath. We all know that story. And here we discover, apparently, the same act is credited to Elchanan, Ben Yare or Gim. And the temptation is overwhelming to say the original story is that Elchanan Ben Yare or Gim killed Goliath of God. But it was such a great story that Elchanan can hold on to it. This often happens in folklore, right? That the major figures suck up stories that are attributed to originally to otherwise unknown or minor figures, especially like the saints' lives. The big saints get all the stories. Right? And you can trace often history of saint stories that originally are told about small local saints, and those stories are too good to remain there, and they are vacuumed up, they are sucked in to the traditions about the big saints, the famous saints. If you're interested in this, ask me for biography. I'll go give you a nice book to read on the subject. So here, too, presumably, we could see, at least here's a shred of evidence showing us the, how these Davis stories get shaped. Right, that there is a historical nucleus, as it were, or at least an earlier version of the story. But the story as we have it is by now fully elaborated literarily, and it's actually a wonderful, wonderful story, but with a very strong moralistic tone to it. Right? What does David say to Goliath before he kills him? He says, I'll teach you, Philistine dog, right, about the, the power of the true God. 
the one true God whom you have reviled today, and today I will be his champion. In other words, it turns into a story about a uh, morality tale, showing how faith in the Lord will triumph, even in difficult circumstances. That's how the story is shaped as we have it. But we began with a much more uh, pedestrian story, I would say, or just a normal story of Elchanan, a warrior who kills the champion of the Philistines. But alas, poor Elchanan, he loses the story, although he does have immortality, he is found in the book of Samuel. Like Achilles and Homer, we can talk about that. Anyway, he, at least he's immortal. Yes, it is interesting. Right. So this is like, they be reading there like their military citation. You know, he got a silver star for valor, and we're reading the account in 2 Samuel 21, that's all we get. And then that becomes this great, wonderful story that, with which we are familiar about David. Okay. So David becomes uh, king after many adventures, uh, taking various women and various wives, uh, running to the Philistines for cover. Uh, you know, an interesting guy, this, uh, the, this, this David. Uh, pretends to be a Philistine for a while, who are the mortal enemies of the Israelites. Uh, uh, but he does lament uh, Jonathan, his good buddy, Saul's son. That's a very touching storyline in, in the book of Samuel, right? That Jonathan recognizes David's greatness and realizes that David will be the king, not he. But nonetheless, he, in, he is friends with David. It's a beautiful, beautiful story, right? Some have suggested there were homoerotic uh, overtones to the story. I don't think so, but that's just me. Uh, anyway... So David finally becomes king, establishes the kingdom, and as we know, is going, this will now be the official royal house now and forever. Although we'll see next time the northern tribes break off very quickly. But we'll come back to that shortly. So um, what does David do? So he builds this kingdom. He builds a palace. He starts to build the institutions of state, which are mostly done by, Sol- by, uh, by Solomon. His strong point is his tribal base. And if you are a historian, you have to say, that's probably why Saul lost out, leaving aside all the theological stuff about uh, Samuel and Saul. Saul is from a small tribe, and you you can't pull off being the monarch, being based in a small tribe. David is from a big tribe, in fact, either the biggest or one of the biggest, the tribe of Judah. So he has a strong power base. His power base is in the south, and the southerners, the Judeans, never wavered in their support for the royal house of David. The northerners broke off, but not the southerners. So I understand why David succeeds and Saul doesn't. Saul is from a dinky little tribe of Benjamin, which in turn ultimately got swallowed up by the the Judeans. It just doesn't endure as his own tribe. So Saul's power base is too small. This is a way of taking the data from the book of Samuel and turning it into what I would call a historical statement, or perhaps a statement which might have claims to some historical basis. So uh, David, with his strong base, uh, establishes a monarchy, uh, at least according to the narrative, uh, wants to build a temple. Um, Interesting point, as we'll see more next time, temple and prophecy are appendages of the monarchy. There's some intimate connection between the temple and the monarch, right? David becomes king. First thing he wants to do, he wants to build a temple. And when Samuel builds the temple, the temple becomes as I said, like, like a royal chapel. It's very much under the thumb. It's priesthood under the thumb of the king. And similarly, there's some great connection between monarchy and prophets. So we get prophets, priests in the temple, and monarch. There's some intimate connection between these, and these are all now emerging, at least according to the narrative of kings, all emerging at the same, at the same uh, time. Why, does the northern, why do northern tribes break off? Northern tribes break off because they don't like the monarchy. They don't like this dynastic monarchy. And they probably don't like the temple. Because building a temple, a fancy schmancy building, as Solomon does, this represents also an innovation. In the wilderness, we have a memory of this tent, this portable tent shrine. When the Israelites come to the land of Canaan, or when their Israelite identity emerges, they have various local shrines, including the Ark, at one, cent- at one shrine in Shiloh, or in Shiloh. But it doesn't occur to anybody to build a fancy building. The king, however, becomes king, and then immediately wants to build the building. So, I don't know which one you're rejecting first, but you wind up rejecting both. The northern tribes see both of these as innovations. 
We don't want dynastic monarchy, and we don't want a temple. And the Judean monarchy has both. In the eyes of the narrator of kings, that's what makes the Judean monarchy legitimate. It has the one and only legitimate temple, and it has the one and only legitimate royal line. But in the eyes of the northern Israelites, apparently, these two very points are the ones that make it illegitimate, that make it innovations, new, untraditional. We've never had these things before. Why do we have them now? And the northern tribes break off. Last but not least, though my time is just about up, um, as I've already clued, clued you in on this, there are intense debates going on among modern Bible scholars whether we believe any of these stories about David and Solomon, especially about all their glory and their, all their conquests and the royal buildings and uh, all the accoutrements of power and state that they established. Is any of that for real, or is all that wishful thinking projected back on David and Solomon from a much later time? Kugel talks about this, and this is still very much in the news, uh, whether we believe these narratives or not. I, Shia Cohen, don't have a strong opinion on the subject because the stories are wonderful, and I'm just happy to read them. And I hope I've in intrigued you as well to get you to read them, too. Okay, everybody, our time is up. Have a wonderful weekend. <laughs>